Hey guys, so in this video, what I'm going to be doing is recapping everything that you read in 14b, which was all about mammals. And to begin with, this should all somewhat be reviewed to us because we've been talking about mammals ever since you were probably in kindergarten. All right, we all kind of know the basic characteristics of a mammal, but nonetheless, that's what we're going to be looking at. And so those basic characteristics include things like they're warm-blooded, they're endotherms. Of course, they have a vertebrae because they are in that phylum. But what really classifies them as mammals is, one, they have specialized teeth. And we're going to see that different groups have even more specialized teeth. Their skin is going to be covered in fur or like a hair. That hairy substance basically is fur. Some of them it's going to be a little bit harder to see or notice on others, like with a dolphin, for example, because dolphins are uh, mammals, they are marine mammals, but you don't see a lot of hair on them. Nonetheless, they do have uh, structures that are similar to hair on their body. They're also all going to produce milk, and that's also where they get their name from. These mammary glands that they have that produce the milk, that's why they're called mammals. And then probably the most important or one of the most important characteristics besides the mammary glands is the fact of how these animals give birth. For the most part, they are all live bearers. In other words, they are going to give live birth. The vast majority of these mammals are what we call placental mammals. And then we have a few that are known as the monotremes and the marsupials. And we're going to talk a lot more about what those mean later on in the video. But for right now, we're going to focus on the placental mammals. Now, of all these mammals, only about, there's only about 7,000 species of mammals, which might seem like a large number. But in the scheme of things, when you think about other animals, that's really not a lot of species. For example, you have about 8,000 species of amphibians, another 8,000 species of reptiles, over 10,000 species of birds, and over 28,000 species of fish. And those are just the vertebrates. Looking at insects, you have over 900,000 known insects, and there's thought to be over 2 million different species of insects. So when we look at a number like 900,000 or even 28,000, 7,000 species is a rather small number. Nonetheless, uh, they're still important. They play a huge role in our lives, especially our food and the way we've been able to uh, develop our cultures and things like that. And just they're a staple in the sense of when we think of wildlife, we think of a lot of these larger animals. They are some of the largest, in fact, the largest animals living today. And so we're going to start looking at them group by group. We're not going to go through all the groups. There's about 20 different groups. Our book just gives us some main ones, and that's the ones that we're going to be looking at in this video. So first up is the order Carn carnivora, the carnivores. And as the name implies, uh, carnivores are meat eaters. They eat meat. And so they have specialized teeth for eating that meat. As you can see here on this Smilodon skull, which is a saber-toothed tiger, you can see those enlarged canines on the side. And in fact, that's where we get the name for the canine teeth that we have. They're those teeth that are meant for tearing and uh, tearing off like bits of meat and things like that. And so these include cats, uh, large and small. They include all the different types of dogs. And they even include bears, raccoons, and even ferrets and weasels. They are all carnivores. They are meat eaters. And these animals, though, only make up about 6% of all known uh, mammals. Up next on our list is actually the largest group of mammals, the rodents. Uh, sometimes these can be seen as a nuisance. Other times they're uh, raised for food and uh, even kept as pets. And we have some in our classroom that we use for the snakes and whatnot. But nonetheless, there are over 2,000 species of rodents. Remember, we said that 
there were approximately 7,000 uh, species of mammals alone. And so 2,000 of those are within this one category of rodents. They include your mice, rats, squirrels, hamsters, muskrats, uh, beavers, and even capybaras, which is uh, this guy right here. Capybaras grow to be the largest rodent in the world. Now, again, these guys, their diet is more like an herbivore. They're going to be eating uh, plant, vegetative stuff, but they are uh, considered omnivores as well because they will have. Uh, sometimes they will take the opportunity to eat protein when they can, whether it be in insects or other meat. Uh, they're opportunistic in that sense. And what really categorizes this group, what sets them apart, are their teeth. Remember we said the carnivores had teeth that were specific for uh, chewing off flesh of animals. Rodents have teeth, specifically two sets of incisors that are specifically designed for gnawing and chewing at fibrous materials, very plant-like materials. And the other thing about these teeth, like if you've ever had a pet hamster or a rat or something like that, you'll notice that they are always, always, or just about always chewing on something, whether it's the cage or food that's in their cage. And the reason for that is because if they didn't keep chewing, these teeth would actually grow out of control and they'd start to spiral spiral around. It's even been shown sometimes where the teeth can spiral back into the skull, and that's not necessarily a good thing. And so they're constantly chewing to keep these teeth wear down uh, so that doesn't happen. But again, rodents are classified or characterized by those teeth. That's a main characteristic of them. And those teeth, those incisors, are constantly growing. Uh, one misconception a lot of people have is they think that rabbits are rodents because of their big incisors, their buck teeth, if you will. However, they actually have uh, more large sets of incisors than rodents actually do. And so they are actually in a different group on their own. They are not a true rodent because of that. Up next are the hoofed mammals, and these are actually two different groups. You're, the textbook talks about them as uh, one group together, but it also makes the distinction to let you know that there are two different groups that are categorized as being hoofed mammals. And what characterizes this group are their feet, uh, specifically their toes. What types of toes do they have? Are they what they call an odd toed or an even toed? Your odd-toed uh, mammals are actually the rarer of the two. In other words, there's not as many of them. These include horses, zebras, and rhinos. Those are your odd-toed uh, mammals. They are generally going to only have like either one or three toes uh, that fuse uh, to make a hoof. And it's the same with our even-toed ones. Uh, these include your deer, your cows, your pigs, your sheep. And if you were to even look at deer tracks, you can see the toe markings here of those uh, animals. And so, again, you tell these ones apart by their, uh, by their hooves or their toes. And that's actually what these are. When you're looking at their hooves, those are the, the toes of the animal. So these guys are also generally herbivores, but again, they have been known to be opportunistic and take protein whenever they can as well, and so some might consider them omnivores. But nonetheless, primarily going to be herbivores, that's what their digestive system is set up for. Uh, if you remember when we talked about the different digestive systems, we talked about how cows, or like a deer, are going to have a longer one for chewing the cud and things like that, and so these guys are herbivores. All right, up next is the Chiroptera, which are bats. Bats actually make up 20% of all mammals. There are over a thousand different species of bats. And so, surprisingly, you know, we often don't think of 
there being so many different types of bats. We think of different types of bears, different types of dogs or cats, but surprisingly, the order of bats is actually one of the largest of all mammals. And these are the only mammals that can actually fly. You might be thinking of like a flying squirrel or a sugar glider right now and saying, well, don't they fly? And technically, no, they glide. And there is a difference. These guys can maintain flight in the air. They don't have to glide from tree to tree. And so they are unique among the mammals being the only type of mammal that can fly. In fact, their name, Chiroptera, simply means hand wing. And because if you look at it, and like we talked about with homologous structures, that's exactly what their wing is. It's their modified hand that's designed for flying. And so another key characteristic about, about bats, if you look at a lot of them, you'll notice that they have very large ears. And just about anybody can tell you that those ears are being used for echolocation. In other words, as the bats are flying around at night, they'll do these little squeaking noises and they'll wait for that sound to bounce back. And depending on whatever they hear, uh, lets them know how far either food is or different objects from them. This can also be dangerous, though, sometimes if a bat is, let's say, trying to catch uh, an insect that's close to the ground. So it's squeaking and then it all of a sudden is squeaking and doesn't notice that there is a barbed wire fence there and it tries to swoop up, it's going to hit that fence because that fence wasn't noticed in time because of that. Uh, another fact that's often not known about bats, bats is that they are not blind. A lot of people will use the expression, you're blind as a bat. However, bats are not blind. Just because they use echolocation doesn't mean that they can't see. And in fact, they do have relatively good eyesight. It's just that they rely more heavily on their echolocation to find their food. That is for those who are insectivores. In other words, those that are going to be eating the insects. There are also uh, herbivores in the sense that there are some that are, eat fruit. And then others that even try and find nectar. Uh, very few bats, in fact, I think it's just one or two species that actually use blood meals to survive on them. Those are, of course, the vampire bats. Up next are the primates. These include your monkeys, your great apes, but they also include lemurs and us. Now, before I move on, I want to kind of talk about that for a second. You see, I put my little picture down here and I included humans in this list of primates. If you read in the textbook, it talks about how evolutionists will try and put humans with primates to point out evolutionary similarities in the sense that are we both mammals? Yes. Do we both have opposable thumbs? Yes. Can we both walk upright on two limbs? Yes, we can do it better than any other primate can, but nonetheless, that is true. Do we have very similar DNA? Yes, all these little check marks. And so the book says that humans shouldn't be classified as primates because God made us separate, which he did, and he made humans unique. That's what we talk about with the Imago Dei, the image of God. That's where we are different than the primates. However, I still include humans in this group simply because just because we group up humans with the primates, we're not saying that humans are animals. All right, we're just saying that we have similar characteristics. Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern classification, he was the first person to group humans in with primates. And he was not an evolutionist. In fact, evolution wasn't even around when he was. And he was a Christian. He believed in God. And so I find no problem in putting humans in this category. But it is important to remember that we are unlike any of the other animals because we do have that image of God. We were made unique in his image. And so, again, like I've said, uh, they have opposable thumbs and they can generally walk on two limbs. However, they're not always going to. They have the ability to, but they're not going to use it very often. Uh, generally, that's just humans that are going to do that. Another thing is that most of them, at least the monkeys, have prehensile tails. And what prehensile means is that it allows them to grab onto things. If you notice, though, uh, we don't have tails. Gorillas don't have tails. 
orangutans don't have tails, and neither do chimpanzees. And this right here is a key characteristic that distinguishes monkeys from apes. If it has a tail, it's a monkey. If it doesn't have a tail, it's an ape. So that's the easiest way to remember if you're looking at an ape or a monkey is, is there a tail? If there's a tail, it's probably a monkey or a lemur. If it doesn't have a tail, then it's what we consider one of the great apes. And these guys uh, consist of about 7.5% of all mammals. So, uh, real quick before we move on, these categories that we've talked about so far, carnivora, the rodents, the hoofed mammals, pyoptera, and primates, they are all placental mammals. And what this means, being a placental mammal, is that the embryo or the fetus fully develops inside the uterus of the animal. In other words, the animal is going to fully develop, and when it's born, it's, uh, it's at, during its development, it stays in what's known as the placental sac. And as this is happening, that's where it develops. It's getting nutrients from the mother. And then once the organism is fully developed, it is born a living creature. Not all mammals do this. One final uh, type of placental mammal I want to talk about that your book just kind of glances over are the cetaceans. And cetacea is the group of mammals that include all the fully aquatic marine mammals. These are your whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Some other key characteristics about these guys is that they generally don't appear to have hair. However, sometimes if you look close enough, you'll see tiny bristles, or even uh, they have a specialized type of bristle within their mouth that's a hair-like structure. And so that's kind of what characterizes them is the fact that they're virtually hairless. Their skin, they have a really thick layer of blubber that helps insulate them. And again, they are placental mammals. They are going to give live birth to a fully developed organism. And then that organism is going to get milk from the mother, uh, just like these other ones. So those are the last of our placental mammals. Now, the last two groups of mammals that we're going to talk about today are the monotremes and the marsupials. First, let's look at the monotremes. It's a really, really small group of mammals. In fact, there's only two uh, basic types of organisms in this group, the duck-billed platypus and the echidna. Um, if you've played any Sonic and you know Knuckles, Knuckles is actually a type of echidna. And these two types of mammals are included in the group monotremes, which are known as egg-laying mammals. These mammals are super weird, all right? They don't really fit the classification. In fact, the only reason that they're considered mammals is the fact that they have a fur and they produce milk. And so because they have those mammary glands, they are put in this mammal category. But other than that, they're just really weird. I mean, for example, just look at the platypus. The fact that it has a tail like a beaver, it has this weird fur, but the face like a duck, and these webbed feet, when the specimen was first brought to scientists back in the late 1800s, they didn't believe that it was a real animal. They thought it was a hoax that somebody was trying to pull on somebody. And it wasn't until they started discovering more specimens that they even realized this was a real type of creature. And so they had to come up with this group to classify them, which are the monotremes. And these guys, instead of having a placental mammal where it develops inside of a placental sac, these mammals actually lay soft eggs, and they will incubate those eggs until they hatch. Once the animal hatches, then the mother will still provide milk. However, it does it a little bit different. Instead of having uh, specific places or locations for mammary glands, like some other animals, it has mammary glands uh, all throughout its skin, like these little mammary pores. So it's kind of like the organism sweats milk. 
and then the animals will lap it up. And so monotremes are really weird. And just like them, another weird group of mammals are the marsupials. And the marsupials, uh, as their name implies, they're known for having a pouch. We generally think of the kangaroo as being the poster child for marsupials because they have that little pouch that they keep their joey in, which is their baby. Uh, but they are not the only one. These include your koalas. Koalas are a marsupial. Possums and opossums. There is a difference. The American possum is the opossum. And they also include things like Tasmanian devils and wombats. If you remember back when we were talking about the digestive systems of these vertebrates, we talked about how wombats have that square poop for uh, allowing them to mark their territory, basically. Another thing about wombats is even though they're a marsupial, their pouch is actually backwards compared to the others. In other words, the pouch faces the back side. And the reason for this is because these wombats are burrowers. And so as they're digging, they don't want all that dirt in their pouch. So God's designed it where their pouch is actually the other way around. And so the reason they have this pouch, or at least some of them have a pouch, because actually possums don't have a pouch, but the reason most of these animals have a pouch is because their babies are born underdeveloped. They don't have a placenta in the sense that the other placental mammals do, but they do spend some time uh, within the mother developing. And as they do this, they start to develop for a few days, a few months maybe, uh, not as long as your other placental mammals. And in fact, they are very underdeveloped when they are born, so to speak, and generally about the size of a jelly bean. These little organisms will come out and they will crawl to the mother's pouch. They'll kind of do like this little army crawl thing with their front two legs and crawl to wherever the pouch is or wherever the uh, specialized mammary teat is. The teat is the area on the mammal where the milk will come out. And what happens is as this little underdeveloped baby finds its way to the pouch or the teat, uh, generally if they have a pouch, the teat is in the pouch but they will latch on with their mouth and then the teat will swell around their mouth, basically kind of locking them in uh, and holding them there until they're fully developed. And uh, generally they will stay there again in the pouch until they're developed. And once they're fully developed, the, the, teat, uh, the swelling on the teat goes back down, allowing the organism to detach. And then you have your little baby that's still not fully developed uh, in the sense of an adult, but developed enough that it can survive outside of the pouch. And these guys make up about 6% of all mammals. So those are pretty much the mammals. Again, uh, there are a lot more mammals than this. This is just a basic overview. But these are the ones that the textbook talks about, and these are the ones that we will be going over on the test tomorrow. So if you got any questions, let me know on your mind, and I will talk to you later.